let's go to our sermon time. I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the little book in your New Testament, 2 John. 2 John. And let's read there verses 4 through 8. The book of 2 John, verses 4 through 8. John writes, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received the commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. John writes in verse 6, And this is love that we walk after his commandments. A child can't tell his father or his mother that he loves them and then refuse to do what they've told him to do. You show your love by obeying their instructions. And then in verse 8, John says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. When a believer is disobedient, when a believer sins, he stands to lose a lot as a Christian. In 2016, then-candidate Donald Trump appealed to for the support of black voters, most of whom had always supported Democrat candidates, by asking them, what have you got to lose? And this is something that most people don't want to hear, and it's the kind of thing that can get you thrown out of certain venues, certain places for even uttering it, but it's nevertheless part of the truth of American history. It was the Democratic Party that supported black slavery in the 1800s. Dinesh D'Souza, very, uh, he was a conservative um, social commentator, an, an immigrant from India. He's done a lot of research into this. And at the, at the outbreak of the Civil War, not one Republican in this country owned a black slave, not one. And he's challenged academics and history professors to prove him wrong, and not a one of them have been able to take up his challenge. Americans fought each other in a civil war over that issue. And the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, immediately giving all black slaves their freedom. He changed the fortunes of black Americans more dramatically to go suddenly from slave to free man than any other bill, any other piece of legislation, any other act of Congress before or since. Uh, however, the Democratic Party, uh, unhappy with that outcome, have sought to rewrite American history with the help of Hollywood and the news media and a uh, tax-supported public education system. And uh, they have now convinced millions of Americans that the Republicans invented slavery. That's the mentality of the world we live in today. Not so. But the continual promises of the Democratic Party never benefited black Americans as they had hoped. So today I want to borrow President Trump's question as the title for my sermon and consider what happens when a Christian sins and ask, what have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? The wonderful blessing about being saved is that you can never lose your salvation. And um, you might lose your car keys, you might lose your cell phone, you might lose your purse, ladies. You might lose your wallet, men, and all the credit cards in or cash in it. But you can't lose your salvation. Very often, the Pentecostal brethren will accuse Baptists 
of preaching that uh, a Christian can go out and live a, an immoral and a worldly life without any consequences because once saved, always saved. I've never heard a Baptist minister in my life preach such things. And if he did, I'd write him off as a heretic. We don't believe that at all. But we do preach once born, always born. Simon Peter writes, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1.23. You might not lose your salvation when you sin, but you can stand to, to lose a lot of things nevertheless. You can lose your freedom when you sin and you commit some crime. Uh, you get arrested or you get uh, detained, you end up in the police hold, or it goes farther than that, end up in the county jail or in a federal prison depending on the severity of your crime or your offense. You can lose your liberty. When you're in prison, you're not allowed to vote in elections like other citizens can do. And even after you've spent your time in jail, paid your debt, as they say, uh, if you're a convicted felon, you're not allowed to own a firearm for the rest of your life, even for legitimate protection. Uh, if your crime involved excessive alcohol and driving under the influence, you might lose your driver's license for the rest of your life. Uh, and uh, depending on the nature of your crime, the nature of your offense, you're not free to live in certain neighborhoods if they're within a distance of a public school or a public park. And uh, if, uh, depending on the, 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 the circumstances, you might have to wear one of those ankle monitors with a transponder on it so the your parole officer or the county sheriff or whoever knows where you are at all times. And you can't go beyond a certain radius. Uh, so you can lose a lot. And those things aren't even listed in the scriptures. Those are things that are part of everyday life today. But you can lose quite a bit. You can lose uh, a good job your boss might fire you because of what you've done. You bring uh, embarrassment to the company and you're, we can't trust you any longer. You can lose your husband, you can lose your wife, commit adultery, lose, and you violate the promises you made once upon a time and uh, lose their love and affection forever and their respect forever and uh, they, leave you, they leave you. You can lose the respect of your children and the trust of your children, your in-laws, your extended family members, your next door neighbors. You know, every time we've lived in different parts of this town and uh, on different occasions, some neighbor has the police come into their house to arrest some family member or to break up some domestic dispute. Once that happens, or rather I should say, every time that happens, my respect for that neighbor goes down a little bit more. I don't want to be that kind of person who affects the rest of my neighborhood that way. But some people don't seem to have very much problem with it. Um, you can lose your sanity through sin, depending on the regularity of your actions, uh, what you watch, what you listen to, what you read, what you smoke, what you drink, what you inhale. You can lose your sanity through all sorts of means these days. And uh, you can lose quite a bit because of sin whether you're saved or not saved. But today I'm concentrating on what a Christian stands to lose when he sins. And let's just see a few things that are listed for us in the word of God. And uh, let me ask, what have you got to lose? First of all, you can lose your light. What I mean by that is your revelation and understanding of God and the things of God because of sin. Look back at 1 John chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. When you sin or you dwell upon the 
the prospect of sin, you're not going to hear the voice of God through the pages of the Bible as you once did. There, there won't be any new light, no new insight or revelation from God when you read the Bible. Uh, as long as that sin remains and it goes unconfessed. As a matter of fact, if you're hanging on to some sin that you don't want to get rid of and you enjoy, you think no one's going to find out about it, you're probably not even reading the Bible to start with. The scriptures say, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalm 119, verse 130. But it won't do that as long as you're hanging on to some sin. Let me ask as we get underway, what sin do you just have to commit before the day is over? Can you think of something that's stirring around in your mind that you just can't wait for church to be over so you can get out and commit it? What sin do you have to commit before this day is over? But the Bible will be a closed book to you. God told Abraham when he was 86 years old, he was going to father a son in his old age with his wife, Sarah. And she was elderly, too. And Abraham doubted God. So he thought he would help God out. And he fathered a, a son, Ishmael, with Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. And that's in Genesis 16, the last verse of that chapter, verse 16. And the very next verse, chapter 17, verse 1, says that Abraham was 99 years old the next time God spoke to him. God refused to speak to Abraham for 13 years because of that sin. So let me say, when you sin, as a Christian, you can lose your light. Secondly, let me say, when you sin, you can lose your fellowship. Notice 1 John 1, <clears throat> verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. A Christian who sins can lose his good fellowship with the brethren, with other Christians, and he can damage his fellowship with the Heavenly Father. King David wrote Psalm 68, or rather Psalm 66, verse 18, If I regard iniquity in mine heart, the Lord will not hear me. And Isaiah told the nation of Israel, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear, Isaiah 59, verse 2. Not that God uh, cannot hear, but he will not. He's under no obligation to respond as long as you're hanging on to some sin that's more important to you than having fellowship with him. He's not obligated to respond. Fellowship has, in, has been broken because of you. There used to be a bumper sticker, and I haven't seen it on any old rusty bumpers in a long time, but it, it used to say, if you're not as close to God as you used to be, guess who moved? It's not God. It's always you. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, undoubtedly, the trouble is with you. Right to the point. That covers a whole range of possibilities there. But if you hurt or offend someone that you love, they might not speak to you until you offer a very sincere and a genuine and a heartfelt apology for what you've done. Try to think of God in similar ways. Because when you sin, you can damage and you can lose fellowship, not only with the brethren, but with God. Thirdly, let me say this. You can lose your confidence. 1 John 3, verses 19, 20, and 21. 1 John 3, 19 through 21. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Another related verse in chapter 5, verse 14, says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If you're a Christian who's 
thinking about sin, wanting to sin, planning to sin, trying to figure out how to get away with sin, uh, you can't have any confidence that God's going to listen to you when you approach him in prayer. Because you're not seeking after his will. You're more interested in your own will. You're more interested in your own will. You're interested in getting away with something. People think if, if no one sees me, then no one knows about it. But they forget there's, there's one person who sees everything and knows everything all the time, 24 hours a day. There's not a, a word you've ever spoken, not a thought you've ever had, not an action you've ever carried out that God didn't see and knows everything about. It's good to know that you're safe. It's good to know where you're going when this life is over. It's good to know that he cares and he stands ready, willing and able to answer your prayers and come to your rescue and come to your aid 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 366 days on a leap year. Uh, but Paul writes, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, Hebrews 10, Verse 19, but if you're fooling around with sin, you're hanging on to something that you know as a Christian you shouldn't be doing, but you say, as long as no one seems to know about it, I can get away with it without any repercussions. As long as that happens, you cannot have pure and perfect confidence that God's not turning a deaf ear to you when you approach him. He may very well be doing that until you get things right. But through sin, you can lose your confidence with God. Point number four, you can lose your joy. Go all the way back to Psalm 51, if you will, please. Psalm 51. After King David had committed sin with Bathsheba, and then after the prophet uh, Nathan had reproved him concerning it all. David repents of his sin, and he writes here in Psalm 51, notice verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 8, Make me to hear joy and gladness, and the bones which thou hast broken shall rejoice. Verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. Verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Verse 13, Then, once those other things are accomplished, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. If you're a Christian who's truly been born again, you've truly been saved, by the grace and the mercy and the kindness and the favor of Almighty God. You can't have any real joy when you're out committing sin because it goes contrary to the conscience God's renewed in you. It goes contrary to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It goes contrary to what you read on the pages of the Bible. Joy is one of the nine fruits of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5.22. But you won't enjoy being a Christian. You ought to enjoy it. But you won't enjoy being a Christian as long as there's some sin that hasn't been confessed and, and forsaken and brought out into the open and asked God to forgive. And you certainly won't be a fit testimony. You won't be ready to uh, uh, teach transgressors the ways of God or be a witness for Jesus Christ as long as you're hanging on to sin un until you make it right. And uh, you'll be a miserable Christian. But a Christian who sins can lose his joy. Point number five, and lastly for today, this isn't a lengthy sermon. You can even lose your life. Turn back, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. And notice there, verse 30. Paul writes that some Christians uh, take the Lord's Supper and they make a mockery of it by not examining their own selves and then uh, judging any sin that may, they may be guilty of. 
verse 30 says, For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. They're dead. In the King James Bible, no Christian is ever described as dying in the New Testament, only as sleeping. And I don't mean they are unconscious in the casket out in the grave like a lot of the cults have supposed. That's not how the Bible uses the term. But uh, Jesus said, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I, and I go that I may wake him out of sleep, John 11. Uh, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him, 1 Thessalonians 4 says. They stoned Stephen in Acts 7. He prayed, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. <laughs> Paul says, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him, 1 Thessalonians 5. The body is certainly dead, but the word sleep is a figure of speech. It's a metaphor. It describes the appearance of the body. Their eyes are closed. We even lay them on a pillow gracefully uh, after they're gone. And uh, he or she looks like they're just sleeping, oftentimes you hear. And the reason Christians are described that way is because when you sleep, it's with the expectation that you're going to wake up again in the morning, right? That's the hope of every believer. They used to call that great getting up morning, old time gospel song. And um, I, one of the gospel, corny gospel quartet hymns I always liked was titled, When I Wake Up to Sleep No More. And um, by the way, no one turns a phrase quite like country western writers do. And even on occasion, sometimes the gospel quartet songwriters. And um, I like the one, I hit her with my golf clubs because she really teed me off, right? That's, that's, one, that's a good one, too. But... Um, it's not beyond God, however, to cause the premature death of one of his Christians who have caused shame to God and brought disgrace to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look back, if you will, at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 1, Paul mentions a guy in the Corinthians congregation who has been messing around with his, either his father's, his father's wife, either his mother or his stepmother, the Bible doesn't specify. And he says that that's something the Gentiles or the unbelievers don't even consider doing. And then he instructs them down in verse 5, quote, to deliver such an one unto Satan, watch it, for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of of the Lord Jesus. That's why I said at the beginning that you may not lose your salvation, but you can still lose a lot because of sin. In this case, maybe even your life. You're the kind of person that just revels in sin. You have no interest in serving God, no interest in pleasing the Lord Jesus, no interest in the Bible, no interest in other Christians, no interest in the welfare of uh, other Christians, or even the 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 future of unsaved folks that you know. You're not interested in that at all. You enjoy the life of the flesh like all of your unsaved friends do. It's not beyond the pale for God to allow you to die early so you won't cause any more damage and bring any more shame and disgrace upon the name of the Lord Jesus and the work of the Lord Jesus. Just when you think God wouldn't do that, he has a way of surprising you. Now, you have to admit, things don't get much worse than some Christian fooling around with his mother. Fortunately, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that this brother evidently got right with God, and then Paul instructs them to forgive him and comfort him, I suppose uh, re receive him back into the fold of their fellowship. Now I'm going to bring this to a close. This hasn't been very lengthy. But when you sin as a Christian, you've got a lot to lose if you're not careful. And to, to answer the question, what have you got to lose? There's quite a bit you can lose. You might not lose your salvation, but you can sure lose a lot of other things. 
David said, for I will declare mine iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin, Psalm 38, verse 18. And then his son later, Solomon, would write Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall find mercy. Praise God for that.